All right, my name is Dr. Robin Sato. I'm in physical medicine and rehabilitation, and I was asked to do this topic on pelvic pain, the road to recovery. Uh, this is a complicated topic, and it's a challenge for most doctors in PM&R and pain management. Uh, but I hope by the end of this talk, you'll have a little bit of insight into what we do, uh, what, what chronic pain management is for pelvic pain, and how you can better um, help yourself to manage it. So um, my objectives today are to talk about um, what the definition of pain is, um, what acute and chronic pain are, why pain management and rehabilitation is important, a little bit about the anatomy of the pelvis, some common pain syndromes and rehabilitation. I'm not going to go specifically into all of them because many of them are in interrelated, but I'm going to talk about the, um, the common ways we treat most uh, pelvic pain syndromes. Um, some medications, interventional treatment, and then alternative medicine. So what is pain? Um, the International Association for the Study of Pain in 2020 uh, defined pain as an aversive sensory and emotional experience typically caused by or resembling that caused by actual or potential tissue injury. And the important thing about that definition is that you can either have trauma, which is actual injury, or you can have potential tissue injury, which means that you don't actually have to have trauma to have pain. And I think that's an important thing that in pain management we recognize, whereas uh, many other fields think that you must have trauma to have pain. That's actually not true. Um, so the society went on to define six other components of pain. I'm not going to talk about them specifically today, but I am going to say one of the main things that's important about pain is that it's individual. It's a personal experience and it's influenced by biological, psychological, and social factors, and that we need to respect people's pain. I think over the course of the past several years, certainly in pain management, with the implement implementation of some of the guidelines in pain in 2016, um, it's been really difficult for people to obtain pain treatment, and there's a lot of shame associated with um, obtaining pain medications, certainly. Um, so most of the time pain is adaptive, but it can be um, maladaptive and can cause some long-term consequences. So um, I think it's important as physicians um, that we, rec we respect people's uh, individual uh, perception of pain. So most, of, most people have experienced some pain. If you didn't, it would be very sad and probably not be around much longer. Um, but so acute pain is protective. We, you know, if you injure yourself or you get involved in a, you stub your toe or you have a back injury, most pain is acute pain. It resolves in three to six months. It usually gets better over time. You know, childbirth, post-surgical pain, injury or fall, you burn your hand on a stove. That pain is meant to protect you from injuring yourself again. And most people understand acute pain like it goes away. There's not, a, there's not an issue with it. But chronic pain is definitely a much more complicated animal. Um, usually chronic pain is greater than six months. And then what happens in chronic pain is you develop this long-term syndrome typically um, after what we think should have, it should have taken, it should have resolved. Um, so chronic pain develops after uh, six months and it develops after an injury has resolved um, or the toxic or no noxious element has been removed. And what we think is that at least in part, it's mediated by nerve damage, not necessarily from the insult itself, but an increase in, in excitability and responsiveness of the neurons. Um, and we call that central sensitization. And this is, um, can be due to a severe acute pain. So acute pain and chronic pain are two different things and we have to treat them in different ways. Um, so pain in men and women is different. Um, more women have chronic uh, pelvic pain than men, but men do also have pelvic pain. Um, but pain in general is more common in women. So it can vary with the menstrual cycle and we think that that's related to our hormone changes. So um, the difference in pain in between men and women, girls and boys is the same in childhood and after menopause. But during um, reproductive years, pain in women is higher. Women have more migraine headaches. They have more pain associated with the menstrual cycle. Um, they have more rheumatologic conditions in general. So women do experience higher levels of pain than men. Um, and there's also differences in the brain activation between area, areas between men and women. So different parts of, your, of the brain activate in men than do in women. 
So really what the goals of pain management are is to um, prevent chronic pain by treating acute pain. So we really wanna make sure we get in as soon as possible and we treat your pain issue. Um, in pain management, we also um, aid in the diagnosis of acute and chronic pain. So there might be diagnostic blocks that we can do. There might be other interventions that actually help us to understand what are, what are the things that are causing your pain. We treat the pain with medications, physical therapy, and we hope that we improve your quality of life and your function. So again, we use physical therapy, different kinds of medications, uh, blocks or interventional treatments, alternative treatments, uh, psychology and support. And at St. Jude's, we have a really wonderful chronic pain program that's been around for 20 or 25 years that really addresses all of those things um, in a comprehensive interdisciplinary program. So our goal with pain management is to know a little about a lot of different fields and to help you coordinate some of your care to make your function better. So a little bit about the anatomy of the pelvic floor. Um, we like to think of the pelvic floor as a bowl that's, that's kind of holding all of your, in, your internal organs in place. So what it does is it, you know, first of all, it provides support for your internal organs. And then it provides opening and closing of different orifices. So we have to, uh, it performs uh, functions of elimination, controlling urination, defecation. Um, it also pre prevents the um, urine and stool from leaking when you're coughing. Um, and then in, in women, it, of course, it serves to function in childbirth. And then it manages sexual activity. So I think the functions of the, the, the pelvic floor are really complex. Um, <clears throat> We tend, you know, common things in pain management are back pain and neck pain. And actually, I really feel that the functions of the pelvic floor are much more complicated and complex, really, even than back or neck pain. Um, it has a lot of complexity, a lot of um, function. And, you know, and it's also really misunderstood in terms of um, what we can do to, to help to treat it. So a little bit more about the anatomy of, of, the, of the pelvis. There is the iliac crest the sacrum, the spine, and the hips. And these, all the musculature and the anatomy that helps the pelvis um, is treated in chronic pain and physical therapy, um, is involved in chronic pain and physical therapy. Um, and you can see here, this is sort of the bowl or the bottom of the bowl of the pelvis, which is, is kind of a sling, and that supports the organs of the pelvis. So here is more of the anatomy. This is the uterus, the bladder, and the bowel, as well as the complex neuro neuro neurological systems, as well as the complex uh, neurology of the pelvis. Uh, in fact, 80% of the serotonin in your body is made in the, in the gut. Um, and so it would make sense that we, we have a lot of um, emotion and pain tied to functions that, have, that happen in the pelvis. Um, so it's a complicated system and some of the, the, um, the nervous system, like the sympathetic trunks, um, the hypogastric nerve, these are involved in functions of the pelvis and some of them can be blocked uh, in terms of uh, pain management. One of the most important pieces of anatomy involved in, uh, pelvic, in pelvic pain is the brain. So the brain uh, alters our perception of pain and it has both an ascending and descending um, component. So if you injure yourself, you stub your toe, you have a back injury, what happens is your pain perception comes from the periphery, it goes up to your brain, your brain processes that information, and then there's a descending pathway that modulates your perception of pain. Um, so many of, this, this, many of the medications that act actually act on the descending pathway, they can act on both pathways, but some of the antidepressants that are involved in pain actually act on the descending pathway and they modulate our perception of pain. So when, when patients ask me, oh, I don't wanna take Cymbalta, I'm really not depressed, but the reality is the neurotransmitters and the systems that are involved in, in modulating pain are the same as they are in depression. And they've been studied independently of depression and they do help to modulate our perception of pain. So, but pelvic pain is really different than other kinds of pain. I think it's, it's much more um, complicated, it's much more sensitive, it's much more emotional. Um, and so pelvic pain is a complicated pain to treat. Um, 
So it affects women more than men, but men are still affected. I've treated a number of men with uh, chronic testicular pain and chronic pelvic pain. Um, there's the sort of lack of understanding about the condition. Um, I think that there's also an expectation that we shouldn't have pain in our pelvis. Um, I think we, we commonly think, oh, I've injured my back or I've injured my neck and people know how to treat that. You know, you would say, oh, I'm sorry, my husband injured his back. We have to get him a massage or send him to physical therapy, but people really don't know how to respond to pelvic pain and they don't know how to console you. So it's a complicated issue. Um, there can be a long time in between treatment and diagnosis. So it can take many years for treatment uh, and diagnosis of chronic pelvic pain. And treatment can be prolonged. It can take a number of years before people get some kind of relief or at least can understand the things that, that um, help their pain or uh, exacerbate their pain. Um, there's a lot of shame and embarrassment about pelvic pain. It's difficult to talk about. Um, I've had patients who haven't had uh, pain treatment for many years because they were reluctant. Um, they didn't want to take pain medication. It was difficult to talk about. Um, they didn't seek treatment for a long period of time. And the problem is that once that happens, um, it becomes more and more difficult to treat. So I think the shame and, and embarrassment and pelvic pain is much as a much greater factor than it is certainly with back pain or neck pain. The other complicating factor is that it can affect your, effect, uh, your sex life, which cause increased stress in relationships. Um, the other problem is that um, it can affect your sex life, which causes uh, increased stress on relationships. And, and that is a complicating factor to chronic pelvic pain that many other pain syndromes don't have. Um, so one concept that's really important to understand in, in chronic pain and, and pain in general is the concept of neuro, neuroplasticity. Neuroplasticity is your brain's ability to change and adapt as a result of experience. Um, and that can be a good thing or a bad thing. So it's a good thing in that you can learn new things. You can recover from a stroke or a brain injury. It, it can increase your cognitive cognitive ability in your memory. So these are all things that are associated with neuroplasticity that are good. And in that way, we can treat your pain. We can help you to understand and change the way you think about pain. That's through physical therapy, through psychology and counseling. And it really can change the way that your brain works. Um, but unfortunately, also with chronic pain, you can have central sensitization. And that means you have this enhancement of neurons in the pain pathways. So what I, I like to tell people is that your brain learns to be in pain. It devotes more neurons to being in pain. You have, a, you know, you're, it's extra fast to respond to pain stimuli. And so what happens is you get more output and increased sensitization of neurons. And that increased sensitization may occur even when you don't have, when you have normal inputs. So like a light touch or something that's not, sh that should normally not be painful then becomes painful. And this is a problem in chronic pain that people don't understand. Um, I have patients that tell me, you know, my husband touched, he put his hand on my shoulder and it was so painful. And so it is painful. It's just that your neurons have, have learned this hypersensitivity and responsiveness to pain. And this is a problem. And this is why we have to help to decrease the sensitivity to pain um, through therapy and through other mechanisms. Um, so your gray matter in your brain actually decreases in chronic pain patients. There are, there are studies that show that your brain changes with chronic pain and that those, those changes will return to normal when you, you become pain free. So I think there's always a feeling in chronic pain that people, people feel that, that they don't have pain or their pain is not acknowledged, but that's actually not true. I think even though it's maybe a nebulous topic or it's difficult for people to understand, um, it is true, so, but neuroplasticity can be your friend or your foe, right? So it's either bad for you and you learn to continually be in chronic pain and you ignore those things or you use this ability of your body to adapt for good. And so this is why pain management and rehabilitation is so important. So what we wanna do is avoid central sensitization and development of chronic pain with early diagnosis and treatment. So if you have something, it's better to seek care early. Um, this is a really sensitive topic for most people because they don't wanna deal with the invasiveness of physical therapy. It's embarrassing and shameful. 
Um, but I'm here to tell you that we treat these things all the time and it's really common and that it's better to do it earlier rather than later. Um, just like when your arm, you get a frozen shoulder if you're not using it, the same thing happens in your pelvis. What happens is if you don't use the, the functions of your pelvis like you should, you will develop um, contractures, you will develop, it will be more difficult for your muscles to function. So it's really important to get early treatment and to help those muscles to function as they should. So in pain management, we also treat all aspects of pain, including physical uh, and emotional components of pain to limit the long-term long consequences of pain. And we hope that we improve your function and quality of life. Um, it is really important to get therapy and there is really help out there if you want it. Um, so a little bit about uh, pelvic pain syndromes because um, pelvic pain is, um, is a little bit difficult to define. It has many, many syndromes and many of these syndromes are related. Um, this definition comes from an international organization in Europe um, dedicated to uh, helping people with chronic pain. Uh, the definition is a non-malignant pain perceived in the pelvis in either men or women. And it's associated with, um, it's often associated with negative cognitive, behavioral, sexual, and emotional consequences, as well as with, of, with symptoms suggestive of a lower urinary tract, sexual, bowel, pelvic floor, or gynecological dysfunction. And generally it's a catch-all phrase, a frame that defines, that, that defines a number of different syndromes. So commonly in my practice, I see people with interstitial cystitis, irritable bowel syndrome. I have a number of people who have um, Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis. These are all really complicated program, uh, problems, but they affect the other organ systems. And so this is why um, chronic pelvic pain can be very difficult to treat. Um, so there are about six different categories of chronic pain and pain in the pelvis, urological pain syndromes, as I was saying, um, interstitial cystitis or chronic bladder pain, with, uh, it's often associated with urinary frequency, burning pain, um, prostate pain, scrotal pain, testicular pain, uh, post vasectomy pain, gynecological pain syndromes. I have patients who have chronic vulvar pain, clitoral pain, and vestibular pain. Um, gynecologic and internal pelvic pain syndromes, endometriosis is very common. Pelvic pain with cyclic exacerbations also very common. Um, irritable bowel syndrome and GI system pain is a very common system. We have people with chronic anal pain and musculoskeletal pain. And I would say most pain syndromes are complicated with chronic musculoskeletal pain musculoskeletal pain and pelvic floor pain only because I think the syndromes are so irritating to the system, to the pelvic floor, that most of the time people do benefit from some kind of physical therapy, uh, pelvic floor therapy. Uh, and then chronic post-surgical pain, that's a, it's a common problem that had an unfortunate consequence of a surgery. Um, I've had a number of people, a number of men with uh, chronic uh, pelvic floor pain, pelvic floor pain, but more commonly it's in women, but it's, it can be a really frustrating uh, uh, comp, uh, problem. So our general approach to treatment is really uh, individual. So I would say everyone is different. What works for one person may not for, work for another. Um, people have different sensitivities to medication. Some people wanna take medication, some people don't wanna take medication. Uh, sometimes pelvic pain is a really relatively minor part of their, you know, problem. Sometimes it's a big part. Um, so everyone has their own uh, different needs, different functions, and different level of severity. So we try to address all of those things. Um, I really think holistic treatment is important. So most, I'm a PM&R doctor, which means physical medicine and rehabilitation. And we do a lot of coordinating between disciplines. So um, so maybe the pain is very disabling and you need to have a diagnostic block, but then you're also, it's very distressing for your relationships. You need to, have, to find a count chronic pain counselor. I can help you with that because our area really is in coordinating um, care from multiple different specialties. 
Um, and understand that there are multiple pain sources. Again, like uh, lots of people who have endometriosis have chronic pelvic pain, and then they might also have interstitial cystitis. These are really common things. The pain systems are all interrelated. The, uh, the neurology of the systems are all related. Um, so it's very common to have all of those things at once. And people will tell you it's, this is my endometriosis pain and that's my interstitial cystitis pain. And sometimes you have to treat those things differently. Um, trial and error. So pelvic pain is difficult to treat, right? It takes a long time. So you have to understand that, um, trying different things is helpful. And sometimes it's not the first or the second thing. Sometimes it's the fourth or the fifth thing that's helpful. Um, and I'm always like completely elated if I get it on the first try, but most of the time that's not the case. Most of the time we're trying multiple different um, modalities to see how it goes. And sometimes starting physical therapy can be painful, but then you need to stop for a little while and rest. So these things do happen, um, but you just have to keep persisting. Um, communication. So please let me know if there's any way I can help you and let me, let me know what helps and what doesn't help. Um, be open and then do some research, join a support group. I have a number of people who um, belong to pelvic pain support groups, which are really helpful. And I think we live in Southern California, which is really amazing and great. And we have a lot of resources here, but in many other places, not, people are not as fortunate to have such great resources. Um, so the basics, of course, are to have a good diet. Um, for interstitial cystitis, there is an icy diet. In fact, you can look online and there's like a hundred different cookbooks on interstitial cystitis. Um, Anti-inflammatory diets, whole food diets, Mediterranean diets, these are all sort of similar diets. They all are really focus on not eating processed foods, um, trying to decrease the inflammation in your body. Um, I have had people lose a lot of weight if weight is an issue on keto. Uh, paleo diets, intermittent fasting, and I have someone doing um, anti-inflammatory diet for an autoimmune disease, uh, which I don't know that much about, but, um, you know, it's always, a, if it would help, I think it's great. Um, see a nutritionist, um, there's lots of great information available. Um, exercise and stretching, many of the stretches that we use in chronic pain um, are from yoga. And one of my patients pointed out the other day, she's like, but you have to do the right stretch. Doing the right stretch is important because doing the wrong stretch can exacerbate the problem. So you want to make sure you work with a therapist, do the right stretch, do uh, pelvic openers and do things that are going to help to relax the tightness that's in the pelvis. Um, stretching and Pilates, um, you know, whatever works for you. I think, you know, lots of people with pain have depression. So walking helps depression, swimming, any kind of cardiovascular exercise is good for your health. I think the recommendation is 30 minutes, five times a day, which I'm not sure we're all getting in the United States, but exercise of course is important for your mental and physical health. Getting emotional support. So there's a Facebook book group on chronic pelvic pain. There's a Facebook group on chronic pelvic pain. Uh, rely on your friends and family or a support group. It can be really embarrassing for some people. And it's, you know, it's hard and your family doesn't want to listen to you anymore or it's difficult. So, you know, sometimes it's helpful to go online and see that other people have similar issues. And pelvic pain is actually quite common. I don't know what the statistics are, but I know it's, it's 20 or 30% at least of the population. And then do some reading and research. So um, there's a really great book called A Headache in the Pelvis, which is written by David Weiss and Ron, uh, Ron, Rodney Anderson. So David Weiss was a psychologist who developed chronic pelvic pain. Um, and so he writes quite a bit about um, the, the, the process and the journey that he went through, through to treat his chronic pelvic pain, the psychological aspects. And then Dr. Anderson is writes about the treatment for pelvic pain. They actually developed a program, which you can go to, I think it's in Northern California near Stanford, where they teach you to do a lot of the exercises that he learned, but it's a nice perspective on pelvic pain. And it actually has a lot of diagrams, which show you what is involved in physical therapy. So if you are nervous at all, or anxious about physical therapy, or you want to learn more, there's a lot of diagrams in that book that actually show what would be done in physical therapy. Um, the interstitial cystitis solution has a lot of really good information, medication suggestions. As I said, there's lots of cookbooks on ice about the, inter, uh, the IC diet. There's a pelvic pain support group. There's a book on um, 
endometriosis and chronic pelvic pain. Oh. And then there's, a, there's, of course, a number of different um, programs on our physical therapy associations on chronic pain, pelvic pain, certain physical therapy in Los Alamitos and Peston has been doing uh, physical therapy uh, uh, for pelvic pain. Certain physical therapy in uh, Los Alamitos and Teston has been doing um, pelvic pain therapy for many, many years. And Julie Sarton started that program. And I think I know it's really grown uh, to be quite large. They have a nice blog. I've had a number of patients go there, male patients and female patients, and they've had really good results. She's been doing it for a long time. I don't know her personally, but I do know that a lot of patients have had really good results there. Um, there's a new place called Pelvic Sanity in Laguna Hills, also dedicated specifically for people with chronic pelvic pain. And then of course, St. Jude's has wonderful pain, pelvic pain um, services. I know I've had a few patients recently tell me that Denise changed her life and that she's had really a great and amazing results with, uh, with pelvic PT at St. Jude's. Um, I've been in practice for a, a little while now, and, uh, and I can say that um, there was, there were very few people that specialized in pelvic PT when I started. And now I'm, I am amazed to see how many people uh, treat, physical, treat, treat pelvic pain with physical therapy. It's like actually an explosion. So I think it's a really great thing. Physical therapy. So physical therapy is really directed at the pelvic floor. And that's the goal is to balance the, the tension in your pelvis, um, to work on the muscular outside of the, pel uh, outside of the pelvis. Um, and this can be a really personal and invasive, but necessary process. Um, my feeling is that nobody knows your body better than you. And also nobody knows your better body better than a therapist who has experience in this area. It's a highly specialized area. You need someone who's got a lot of training in the area and a lot of sensitivity. Um, so people who do pelvic pain therapy, they are um, skilled and they know this area of the, of the pelvis well. So I think it's really important to, to pursue someone who has some very intimate knowledge of that particular area. Uh, one of my, many of my patients have used something called a pelvic wand, which is training for, um, it, which is used for at-home treatment. So here it is from Amazon. Um, there's a number of different things that are available on Amazon. Again, I did this research and I was amazed to see what there was. I would say about the pelvic wand, um, I have had some people get very excited about it. Say, this is so great, I'm gonna go use it. But I, I really feel like you need to have some guidance with regard to this because it can be painful and the area is sensitive. So uh, typically what people do is they go to their therapist and they get training on this particular thing um, because I don't want anybody to injure themselves. I think it's an important tool. Um, uh, some other things worth mentioning, um, the LV trainer, but these are mostly for incontinence. There's apps that, that are on your phone. There's like a Kegel bells and all kinds of things. Um, there's the course that on headache in the pelvis um, from Dr. Weiss and Dr. Anderson. I, I, I don't know anything about that, but I think it's kind of an, a good way to start. So here's some of those things. The pelvic gym is, I just found online. Again, I don't know that much about it, but this is something that you could do at home. I think there's a free trial for a couple of weeks and they do actually have uh, a pelvic uh, floor, um, a pelvic pain program that's specifically for pelvic pain. So I don't know anything about it. I'm not here to promote it, but I am saying it's better to get early treatment than later. Um, so medications that are used for pelvic pain, of course, are those that are used specifically for your condition. So if you have interstitial cystitis, it might be Urabel or Elmeron, Bentol for IBS, whatever it is that you're using to treat your syndrome. Usually I'm not prescribing this, this would be your urologist. Um, but neuropathic pain medications include, these are non-narcotic medications, include gabapentin, Lyrica, Cymbalta, and Effexor. Gabapentin and Lyrica are um, seizure medications. Cymbalta and Effexor are um, antidepressants. These are both used for chronic pain. Um, they sort of dampen the signals that come from the nerve, and so hopefully it's less irritating. Anti-inflammatory medications, of course. Opiate pain medications, and I, I say this, um, 
you know, it had there, they generally have a lot of stigma associated with them. The other negative to using opiate pain medications is they can cause a lot of constipation, which can be aggravating and chronic pain. Um, but uh, this is still a legitimate form of treatment. So people can, you know, often use Norco, Percocet, oxycodone, or morphine and say it's uh, pelvic floor therapy is very painful, or you need that to get to sleep at night or whatever it is you need it for. It's, it's perfectly fine to take pain medication. Um, I think there's been a lot of stigma over the course of the past four or five years about pain medication, which is quite shameful in my opinion. But if you need pain medicine, medicine you should take it. Uh, buprenorphine, I think, is an underutilized medication. Uh, buprenorphine is also used in addiction, but at lower doses, it's used in chronic pain. The two types of the two brand names of those medication are Belbuca and Butrans. Butrans is a patch, and Belbuca is a film. These are long-acting medications. They're considered a Schedule Three, which means there's less likelihood of overdose, and they're actually underutilized. I feel. Um, but they are long acting medications. So they're meant for people who have uh, chronic long term pain. Um, they're a little bit complicated in terms of a medication, but I think I've had some pretty good success with people who are using buprenorphine for pain. Uh, the only other issue is that insurance can sometimes be a challenge when it comes to this. Um, and opiate pain medications obviously come in long acting and short acting forms. Um, these have, um, you know, extended release formulations that last, you know, eight hours or 12 hours or however long in the case of fentanyl patch would be 72 hours. So um, some of these medications are for people who have really long term chronic pain. Um, again, antidepressants. Um, doxepin is a very old antidepressant. It's used really mainly for sleep, but it has been shown to have some benefit for chronic uh, pelvic pain. Um, I think it's also a, a lesser known medication because it's uh, been around for a very long time. It can be kind of sedating, but you're if you're having problems with sleep and pain, doxepin can be a good medication. Uh, muscle relaxants, there's a variety of them. Um, and compounded medications, I think this is actually a very helpful category for people who have chronic pain. So there are a number of compounding pharmacies around. Um, Baclofen is a common uh, medication that can be compounded in a, in a suppository. So I do have some people who use a compounded baclofen suppository for um, pelvic floor therapy. And that can be made with gabapentin or other um, tricyclic antidepressants. So these things are really helpful. I have, I have actually had quite a few people have some pretty good benefit from them. Uh, generally, insurance doesn't cover them, but they're around $30 or $40 generally, which is not too terrible in the scheme of things. Um, so those things are really helpful for pelvic pain. Um, another thing I thought I would mention is low-dose naltrexone. Naltrexone is an opiate antagonist. It's been studied a little bit in chronic pain. Um, it's, I wouldn't say it's off-label use. There's been a number of studies on it, but if you don't take any pain medication and you are interested in trying something that might work, but that's not very, uh, and doesn't have um, much risk, low, del low, uh, low dose naltrexone might be helpful. Low dose naltrexone might be helpful. Um, so that's, those are some of the medications we use for chronic pain. Um, again, so for low dose naltrexone, <clears throat> typically this is also not covered by insurance. It's a compounded medication. Uh, it's running 30 or $40 a month uh, in compounded doses and you usually do have to taper it up. So that's another option. You can read about it online. Um, I can't say I have a lot of experience with it, but I've had a few people that were interested in trying it. The only thing is you have to be off of your pain medication in order to try it. Um, interventional treatments. I'm not an interventionalist, but there are a number of really great interventional doc pain doctors around here. The two most common blocks I see for pelvic pain are ganglion impart blocks and pudendal nerve blocks. Uh, the superior hypogastric blocks are not that common. I haven't seen it done that often, but I do know there are people that do them. I don't do them, any of them. Um, I've had a number of people have pretty good results with uh, pudendal nerve blocks and ganglion impart blocks for rectal pain. Um, and pudendal nerve blocks have, have given some people some pain, so for some relief of their pain. Um, I would say in general about blocks, they are, can be a little bit helpful in that they know, it would help us to know which nerves are involved in your pain syndrome. 
Um, I would say it's almost like epidural injections, the likelihood of it eliminating your pain is pretty unlikely. But if you get a block and it helps um, you to participate in therapy or it helps for some period of time, you know, all the better. I think it's good. And, and you still have to work on the sort of comprehensive part of treatment with chronic pain. Um, spinal cord stimulation was there. I read an article on spinal cord, cord stimulation for um, pelvic pain and it has the highest explant rate. So spinal cord stimulators are implanted in, in the, the membrane above your spinal cord. We do them commonly for back pain. I guess less commonly they're done for, um, for pelvic pain. They have a really high explant rate, which means that they're probably not that effective in the long term. I will just say, I have not seen this for a while, but there is a, uh, there's an, um, a device called Interstim, which is used for um, pelvic floor incontinence. And I have actually had a few people have Interstim who've had some good relief of their pelvic pain for whatever reason. So. Um, that's just an off-label just thing that I have, you know, noticed in the course of time. So psychotherapy and counseling. Um, in my opinion, everyone should go to psychotherapy and counseling. Um, certainly with the coronavirus and everything that's been happening recently, I think it would be helpful for almost anyone. Um, I think there's still a lot of stigma about psychology and psychotherapy. I mean, it's pretty common for people to go once a week. Um, when they're dealing with a really acute problem, I always tell people to look on psychology today. They have a great list of therapists um, and there's sort of an online guide if you're looking for someone to meet a specific need. Um, so I always say, you know, it's six, the, your success depends on you and your relationship with your therapist. So find someone good, find someone you feel that you can open up to and find someone you feel comfortable with. Um, pelvic pain causes a lot of significant distress and suffering and there's shame associated with it. You know, I have patients that, you know, really, it's really disrupted, disrupted their sex lives and the intimacy with their partner. And that can be really challenging. Um, so, you know, results do show that counseling is equally effective as antidepressants. So like I said before, with regard to neuroplasticity, there are changes in your brain that are associated with therapy. And those neurological changes and the chemical changes that occur with counseling are equally as effective as antidepressants. So <clears throat> I always think it's better to go to counseling. These are long-term effects. They teach you skills to cope. And it, there should be no shame associated with going to therapy. It only makes your life better. Um, here at St. Jude's, there's a, several therapists that specialize in treatment of chronic pain. So there's Allison Bixler, there's Gary Baffa, and there's um, Sherry Bates. And those people all specialize in dealing with chronic pain. I'm sure there are other ones I may not know of, but I know that they were associated with the pain program, the chronic pain program at St. Jude's. Um, alternative treatments, um, acupuncture has been found to be helpful in reducing prostatitis, certainly chiropractor for osteopathic treatment. I know as a DO, there are some osteopathic treatments that are associated with chronic pelvic pain and, pe and pelvic floor re relaxation, massage, biofeedback, um, vitamins and supplements. You know, I think for IBS, maybe probiotics is helpful. I have people who have interstitial cystitis that swear by aloe vera. I don't know the results of the studies of those things. Um, vitamin D, but I do have people that have had good results with those things. I mean, these herbal medications like Gotu Cola, uh, marshmallow root, and, and aloe vera, they tend to be herbs that coat the bladder. I did talk, I went to an herbal medicine course and I talked to someone about go to cola and they said if they, if they were treating with uh, someone with interstitial cystitis, they would have them drink go to cola for three months. I don't know if you could do that, but I think it's a good suggestion. Why not try um, CBD or cannabidiol, which is maybe controversial, but shouldn't be legal in all 50 states. Um, this helps to, um, to maintain your body's sense of homeostasis or kind of sense of health. Um, you can buy this at Sprouts, you can buy it over the counter at CBS. Um, there's a company called Foria that makes um, compounded CBD depositories. Uh, I think they're really expensive. I looked into it. They were ridiculously expensive, no offense to Foria. But um, I'm convinced you could make them on your own if you're crafty, but, I, but they are out there and I have had people try them and they, are, they seem to be pretty effective. 
um, sits baths and pelvic steams. If you go on Etsy, there's like a number of different pelvic steams. I went to this, uh, to a place called Green Wisdom. I live in Long Beach and there is an herbalist there. And she talked about some of the pelvic steams. I, and they, she said, actually, they can be kind of dangerous, but it's better to do a sits bath. They have um, a sits bath of some herbal medication at, at Green Wisdom for 10 or $15. I would say if you're really suffering, it might be worth a try. I don't know, but um, it's not my area of expertise. Um, so in conclusion, I just like to encourage people to get treatment earlier rather than later. Again, uh, early treatment is the key. So get on top of it, you know, take care of it, get your pelvic floor therapy, um, take medication if you need to, and hopefully you won't need to take it for the rest of your life. So you can just get on with your life and you can just deal with it now and then it'll be over with. Um, Understand that these syndromes are difficult to diagnose and treat. They take a long time. Just because somebody says, oh, I don't believe you have pain or someone's not nice to you or whatever happens in pelvic in chronic pelvic pain, that ha can happen frequently, I've been told, not by anyone I know. Uh, but but you know, it's it's sometimes embarrassing to get treatment. I think it's important to just try to find the people who you know will be caring and can help you through the program. And there's lots of online resources now. Um, if you need medication, take them. I mean, I think, you know, there's this whole stigma about opiate pain medications and no one should take them. And, you know, we have a society of addicts and all this other nonsense. I mean, yes, that's true, but also people have chronic pain and they need to take pain medication in order to get them through that period of time. So that's totally fine. Um, try physical therapy, you know, do mental health therapy if you need to. You can consider alternative medicine and treatment, you know, try acupuncture, do stretching, do all those other things. Um, intervention. So if you're interested in pudendal nerve blocks or ganglion impar blocks, and I don't do them, but there's a number of people that do them, Dr. Kwok, Dr. Ho, or Dr. Zapata, um, uh, Dr. Ko at St. Joe's, at St. Jude's, they all do uh, these blocks. And so it's important to be able to um, if you want some treatment like that, to ask those questions when you go to uh, seek treatment. Um, surgery, if needed, I would say surgery is not always effective in these cases. I mean, there are some surgeries such as bladder dissension surgeries, and there's some surgeries for endometriosis, not my area of expertise, but um, certainly worth talking to a specialist in that area if, if that's where you are at. Um, and take care of your health, take care, control of your health. It's important. Um, know that we're here to help you if you need it. And um, that's it. I hope it was helpful and um, have a good day, I guess. Seek treatment for your pain if you need it, and hopefully it won't be a chronic problem. Take care. Bye-bye.